So it was a Thursday morning, and a man named Jan Eric Olson was on leave from prison. He decided to walk into a local bank armed with a machine gun. And so he walks in, and the first thing he does is he unloads a clip at the ceiling. Let's everyone know that he's in charge and that this was indeed a bank robbery. In fact, there were sources that would later say that he cried out, The party has begun. A few moments later, Olsen would take four of the bank workers captive. He took them and put them into the bank vault. And then after this, he reached out to the police and gave them his list of demands. He wanted this. His friend and fellow prisoner, uh, Clark Olafson, to be released from prison and brought to the bank. Next, he wanted $3 million in cash, two guns, bulletproof vests, helmets, and a fast car. These are the things that Olson wanted in exchange for the lives of four bank workers that he held captive. Could you imagine being one of those bank employees thrown into the vault, being held captive, being held captive, taken hostage, basically imprisoned by a man that was willing to take your life for some money and some other things, willing to do you great harm. While I hope that none of us in here will ever be physically taken captive like those bank workers, I think that most of us can relate to being figuratively held captive. For some of you, you are held captive right now in these moments. Maybe it's a job. You hate your job, but you go to your job because it gives you money. It drains you. It takes everything out of you. Maybe for some of you, it's a really bad decision or a choice that you've made in the past. And that one decision, that one choice has marked you for the rest of your life. And you feel like that your present is held captive by your past. Maybe for some of you, it's just a bad habit that you're in the middle of right now. And it's just got its grip upon you. Maybe it's alcohol. Maybe it's shopping. For some of you students, it might be video games or TV. Maybe it's sports. Maybe it's smoking. Maybe it's self-harm. Maybe it's gambling, and the list just goes on and on. But this vice in your life holds you captive. For many of us, fear is the thing that holds us in bondage, that keeps us captive. And what we've done is, is we've built up a wall around us so that no one can get in. But what's happened is, is that wall has actually kept us from getting out. Everyone is handcuffed and held captive by something. But I'm here to tell you this morning that by faith, you can be delivered and set free by the Savior. If you have your Bibles with you, please open them up with me to Hebrews chapter 11. We are looking at verses 29 to 31 today. And I get to conclude our series called Standing on the Shoulders of Giants. It's been a fantastic series, one that I've truly, truly enjoyed. Um, We get to finish up our journey, as Pastor Larry said, through Hebrews chapter 11. And I get to tie a bow on it as we have walked through the hall of faith. I've said this each time that I've been up here during this series, but uh, back in 1675, Isaac Newton, Sir Isaac Newton said this, If I have seen further, it is by standing on the shoulders of of giants. And what he meant by that was, is all of the people that had done some innovative things, all the the people in his past, because of their innovations, he's able to stand on their shoulders and do so much more. And the very same thing is true for us when it comes to our faith. We're able to stand on the shoulders of the giants of faith in our past. And we've seen them all here in chapter 11. From Abraham to Sarah, from Moses to To Joseph, we've seen men and women of faith that didn't look to the city of men and to the things of men, but rather looked to the city of God and to the things of God. And this morning, my prayer is is that we would be able to imitate their faith in such a way that it changes not only how we view things now, but also how we do things. And so this morning, we turn our attention to verses 29 through 31 of chapter 11. And my prayer is is that you can receive deliverance through faith. Let's read that together. Verse 29 says this. By faith, the people crossed the Red Sea as on dry land. But the Egyptians, when they attempted to do the same, were drowned. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell down after they had been encircled for seven days. And by faith... 
Rahab the prostitute did not perish with those who were disobedient because she had given a friendly welcome to the spies. So this morning from this passage, I want to look at all three of these situations in these three verses and expositionally walk through them and help you to see how that through faith they received deliverance. My hope is, is that we will rightly then be able to take these things and apply them to our lives today. But here's the most important thing. Most importantly, my goal will ultimately be to point us all to the one that can bring deliverance for anything in our lives, and that being the person and the work of Jesus Christ. So, first thing we learn from this passage is, is through faith, receive deliverance from what enslaves you. Through faith, you can receive deliverance from what enslaves you. Let's read verse 29 together. It says this, By faith, the people crossed the Red Sea as on dry land, but the Egyptians, when they attempted to do the same, were drowned. Now, for those of you that may not be familiar with the parting of the Red Sea, let me share a little bit of background with you. So this is a spectacular event. It's the culmination of God delivering his people from being enslaved by the Egyptians. If you go all the way back to Exodus chapter 1, it says that there came a Pharaoh that did not know Joseph. And Joseph is the primary character in the latter half of the book of Genesis. But there came a Pharaoh that didn't know Joseph, didn't know Joseph's people, the Hebrews. And so this Pharaoh was afraid of the Hebrews, that there was going to be an uprising by the Hebrews. So what he decides to do is to put them into captivity, enslave them, make them slaves for him and for the Egyptians, and to do their work. According to Exodus chapter 12, just a little bit further in verse 40, it says that it would be 430 years later. 430 years later. Think about that. Longer than we have been a country. 430 years later that the people of God would finally be freed from bondage. That God would raise up Moses, send him to his people, the Hebrews, and that they would be led out of Egypt. So then we get to chapter 14. The Pharaoh decides to change his mind after he had previously let the people go. He changes his mind. He's like, what have I done? God has hardened his heart. All kinds of stuff happens. But ultimately, the Pharaoh sends his army. He sends his horsemen after the Hebrews as they're leaving Egypt. And they're right behind them as the Hebrew people are on the edge of the Red Sea. Now, if you're familiar with Scripture, then you know that the Israelites are terrified at this point. I mean, wouldn't you be? You've got this huge army coming after you. You've got this Red Sea in front of you. And this is what they say to Moses, their leader. They say to Moses, Moses, we would rather have lived in captivity in Egypt rather than die out here in freedom. They preferred captivity over freedom. Let me take you back to that hostage situation I mentioned a moment ago. So at last we left off He's given his list of demands. The police, they find everything that they can to make sure that he gets these demands. So they go and they get his friend Olafson out of prison. They send him into the bank as a point that they hope would be communication between them, the police, and Olson. Within a few hours, they arrived with everything else, the ransom money, all the stuff, all the requests, and they even brought a blue Ford Mustang with a full tank of gas. The government's only request was is that they leave the four hostages in the bank as they leave. But Olafson and Olsen, they don't like these terms. They thought that they needed to keep the hostages in order to make sure that their escape went smoothly. And so there came a stalemate. A little bit after this, the police um, was able to get in contact with some of the hostages on the phone. Now, while they're doing this, the world outside is watching. The world is horrified. The world thinks that this duo, Olsen and Olafsen, are monsters. There are crews, news crews uh, camped outside of the bank. The public is growing more opinionated. They're worried. They are disgusted with the men inside, the captors. Here's the crazy thing. Inside the bank, inside the bank, inside that vault, something very strange was happening. The hostages were actually defending their captors. They were defending them, and they didn't even want to be released. This is the Hebrew slaves here on the edge of the Red Sea, just like these hostages. They preferred what they thought was safety in captivity over the uncertainty of freedom. 
so often aren't we the same? We prefer the familiarity of captivity over deliverance. Now, if you're like me, you read in Hebrews uh, chapter 11, verse 29, and it says that by faith that the Hebrews crossed the Red Sea and the Egyptians drowned. How is this true? Isn't it more like by fear? Well, let me help you put yourself into the shoes of one of the Hebrew people at this point. So you got, the, you got the army at your back, and Moses does this awesome thing, and the next thing you know, the waters start to rise on both sides, and you have these walls, and some scholars believe it's hundreds of feet tall. Hundreds of feet tall, and Moses is sitting there, and he's like, all right, guys, let's go. I don't know about you, but a normal response might be, um, Moses, if we walk in there, won't the water come crashing down on us? Won't that happen? And Moses, I imagine Moses probably said something, no, God's got this. He's kept his promises so far. Let's take this next step. So with the Egyptian army at their back and the sea at their front, they finally walk out into the ocean in obedience. And by faith, they were delivered from what had enslaved them. 430 years of captivity, generations upon generations of captivity, and they're delivered from the bondage that they had been in. With the possibility of the walls and the sea that could come crashing down on them, they walked out by faith and they lived. And then the Egyptian army came in and they were drowned. So that's the first thing we see from this passage. Second, we see that through faith we can receive deliverance from what obstructs us. Through faith, receive deliverance from what obstructs you. Let's read verse 30 again. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell down after they had been encircled for seven days. Now, the walls of Jericho, this story takes place primarily in Joshua chapter 6. At this time, we've got a new leader. Moses is not the leader anymore. Joshua is the Hebrew leader. And God tells Joshua, he promises Joshua that they are going to receive victory over Jericho. And Jericho has these amazing, huge, fortified walls that nobody can get in. But here's what God tells Joshua to do. Here's what God tells Joshua to do. He says, all right, I need you to take all the men of war, and for six days I want you to walk around, each day walk around the outside of the walls. And on the seventh day I want you guys to walk around seven times, and I also want the priests to blow their horns. And when all that's done, I want everyone to scream and yell, and then the walls are going to come down. Now, I don't know about you, but this sounds crazy, right? Sounds crazy to me. I've never heard anyone have this type of military strategy. We're going to defeat the army by walking around the walls. God is basically telling them, if you want to overthrow the city, you don't even need to engage them in military combat. But Joshua and the Israelites, they obey. They follow the instructions of the Lord. The walls fall down. They receive deliverance from the things that obstructed them. They receive deliverance from the things that stood in their way. I'm really excited about this fall. In fact, we have soccer tryouts um, and evaluations for our kiddos for our our soccer league here at Graceland in July. And guess what? My son is finally old enough to be able to play. And so our our recreation director, Karen, is like, yes, I got a new coach. And so um, I'm going to be... I'm going to be coaching my son, Roman, because he's, he's finally four. Really excited about that. And it made me think back to when I was younger. And my dad... He's just as crazy about sports as me. In fact, probably a little bit more so. But he put me into soccer, into baseball when I was four. And it made me think back of my very first season as a little leaguer, right here in New Albany at the Little League down there by Scribner. And we had a really great first season. We got third place in the regular season, and then we made it all the way to the championship game um, that year. Now, I wasn't too excited about that game because the team that we were placing was undefeated. They had won the season, and they had the very best hitter on their team. Had the very best hitter. We came to the end of the game. We were up by one run in the last inning. There are a couple people on base, and guess who comes up to bat? He's the last batter, none other than their best hitter. And this kid is cool, man. So I'm four, and I think it was a fourth or six-year-old, and he's one of those six-year-olds that had a mustache, you know what I mean? <laughs> and so he comes up there. He's got to be like six foot, and I'm like, what is going on? 
But anyways, um, he has like the, the big league chew in his mouth, you know, you know, that type of kid. He's spitting and everything, and I have no idea what's happening. But he's one of the few kids that could actually hit the ball out of the park. And he's coming up to bat, a couple guys on base. I think we have no chance at all. I am playing what is like the pitcher at this time. So we actually don't have a pitcher. It was uh, the coach would pitch, but you're like the center circle guy. And that's what I'm playing. And my dad, he tells me, he's like, Ryan, I want you to go stand as close as you can to the batter without being in the way. And I look at him and I go, no. (laughs) And he says, no, seriously, I want you to go stand as close as you can. I'm like, no. (laughs) Finally, he gets me to go up there and I'm I'm afraid I'm going to get like a, a tattoo of a baseball on my forehead. But I finally go up there, and you're never going to believe what happened. He swings as hard as he can, and he hits this tiny little pop-up that goes right into my glove. And we win the game. Now, I say all that to say this. Uh, Well, what I'm not saying is, is that God just gives us what we want and that this stuff happens all the time, that we have these selfish desires and things happen. But what I do think is this, is, is that God wants us to humble ourselves to be delivered from the obstacles that stand in our way, to be delivered from the barriers that hold us captives. You see, I had this barrier of fear of going up there, but my dad wanted me to humble myself, which I thought was crazy, but I went up there. I trusted my dad because he had always looked out for me in the past. I knew that the hitter on the other side, he was super prideful. He was putting all of his beliefs in himself to crush one out. And see, this is what the Hebrews did. This is what the Hebrews did. They were led by Joshua, and they were humble enough to do something absolutely crazy in the eyes of the world, which was to walk around the walls of Jericho. I just imagine the Canaanites sitting inside the walls looking out and be like, here they come again, those crazy people. I can't wait until they get done and tire themselves out. Then we're just going to take them out. But in order for us to receive deliverance from the things that obstruct us in life, We must humble ourselves and listen to what it is that God would have us do. Faith is demonstrated through our obedience. We must be obedient to God's will to receive deliverance. Don't miss this. We must be obedient to God's will to receive deliverance and not look to achieve freedom on our own for the things that we want. So often, though, that's what we do. We want freedom from persecution or from suffering or from pain. And we don't seek God's will to be set free from the things that he wants us to be set free from. Third and final truth we see here is this. Through faith, receive deliverance from what defines you. Through faith, receive deliverance from what defines you. Let's read verse 31 again. By faith, Rahab, the prostitute, did not perish with those who were disobedient because she had given a friendly welcome to the spies. So let me unpack the story of Rahab for you very quickly. This takes place in Joshua chapter 2 and also verses 22 through 25 of Joshua chapter 6. There in Joshua chapter 2, we read that um, Joshua sends a couple spies into Jericho to do some recon work. There they meet this lady named Rahab. And you'll notice back even in Joshua chapter 2 that she is known by her profession a prostitute. Same thing here in Hebrews chapter 11. So the king hears that there are some spies in his town at Rahab's, so he sends some men to go to Rahab's place to find out what's going on. Rahab hides the men in her home and then sends the guys that that came in. She sends them on a wild uh, goose chase, the men from Jericho. Then Rahab lets the spies out and she says this. She says, I've heard about the events of the Red Sea and I believe that your God is the one and true God. So whenever you bring down the walls of Jericho, please remember me, please remember my family and all of my relatives. After that, she helps them escape and go back to Joshua where he tells them, where the spies tell Joshua all that they had learned. So let's fast forward to after the walls of Jericho, they come tumbling down. And here's what's really cool, what happens in in chapter 6, verse 22 through 25 of Joshua. Rahab is saved. Her life is spared. Not only that, but all of her relatives, all of her family, their lives are spared. And this is a huge thing. 
This is extremely huge because Rahab is not one of God's chosen people. Rahab is not an Israelite. She's not a Hebrew. She's not a Jewish person. She's a Gentile. And not only this, but she is a prostitute. But because of Rahab's faith, she was delivered from what had defined her in her past. Because of Rahab's faith, she is delivered from an identity that has haunted her her whole life. Because of Rahab's faith, she's delivered from a label that only pointed out the mistakes that she had made. It would have been much easier for her just to continue living the life that she was living, living in the shame that she had because of the profession that she had. But instead, she decided to be delivered through her faith. She had faith in God. She was delivered from what had always defined her. Let me take you back to the story of our hostage situation. Eventually, six days after Olson had entered the bank, the police just outside, they finally came to a decision. They had no idea what to do because every phone call that they had made with one of the hostages, they had said, hey, don't come in. You know what I mean? We don't even need to be released. In fact, we would love for you to have mercy on the people that have taken us hostage. Crazy stuff. So on August 28th, 1973, they decided to go in by force. The police pumped in tear gas into a vault in, in a small hole in the ceiling, and Olafson and Olsen, they um, surrendered almost immediately. But it still gets crazy. The police, they rush in, they go back to the bank vault, and they ask the hostages to come out first. And the hostages say, why don't you let our captors go out first? We're afraid that if we come out first, you'll actually shoot them and kill them. Even after they get them out, the people taken calf, captive, the hostages, they defended their captors. Now, if you're familiar with history, you probably know this event. It took place in Stockholm, Sweden. And the unexplainable allegiance that these captives felt for their captors became known as Stockholm Syndrome. And since then, we've seen case after case of people who are held hostage or taken captive, giving allegiance to their captors. In fact, the day after being released, one of the hostages, her name was Elizabeth Oldgren, she admitted that she didn't even know why she felt this way, but she said this, is there something wrong with me? Why don't I hate them? That's the question I have for all of us in this place this morning. Why don't we hate the things that hold us captive? Why don't we hate the things that hold us captive? I think one of the greatest reasons is, is often we misidentify what it is that's keeping us in chains. We try to deal with the symptoms. We try to deal with the addictions, the alcoholism, the pornography, the gossip, the sexual immorality. All of these symptoms are the things we go after, and we don't go after the root. And my friends, let me tell you, the root is sin. The root is sin. We have to recognize first that we are broken, that we are sinful, and that we are in need of a Savior. And then... Then we can be delivered. We can't deliver ourselves, but then we can be delivered. It's only after we come to the end of ourselves that we can truly see Jesus Christ. It's only then that we can repent and believe. It's only then that we can receive forgiveness and deliverance. It's only then that we can truly respond to the gospel, to what Jesus did on the cross. It's only then that we can receive the reward that comes from Jesus being raised from the dead. It's only then that he can break the chains that enslave us. It's only then that he can tear down the walls that obstruct us. And it's only then that he can erase the labels that used to define us. Friends, you are no longer dead if you know Jesus, but you are alive. Through faith, you are no longer a liar, but you're a child of God. Through faith, you are no longer an adulterer, but you are an heir of Christ. And through faith, you are no longer separated from God, but you are set free in Jesus Christ. So let me ask you this this morning. Do you have Stockholm Syndrome when it comes to your sin? Are you so close to it and held so captive by it that you're not even sure you want to be released from it? Are you like the Hebrew people at the edge of the Red Sea, rather going back to Egypt, being held captive there, 
than being set free and trusting in God? Or, or do you hate the things that hold you captive? If you do, then this morning I would encourage you to receive the deliverance that comes by faith in Jesus Christ.